Uh, I'm Amy Walter. I <laughs> with the Cook Political Report, and on the panel with me, who will be presenting, Mike Basiles, Republican pollster, based out of Austin, Texas. He's worked for a number of names you probably have heard of: Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rick Perry when he was governor, correct? And then was also uh, also worked on the Trump 2016 campaign. Joel, whatever. Joel Benenson, who. Uh, was Obama campaign and Hillary Clinton 2016 campaign, plus done many other high profile races you have heard of. He's going to discuss the fact that he's a recovering journalist, right? And Lee Marinoff, you've seen his polls. He's with Marist, uh, and they partner with a number of news organizations as well, including NBC and PBS and NPR. Um, we were going to. Amy, I thought oh. you were going to have me sit between them, and I would be ducking. Oh, you'd be the guy, <laughs> right? He's take our the, he's our public pollster. Yes, I think so. We're going to get into the differences between that. Here's the thing that I uh, I love talking about polling. People love trafficking in the numbers. Um, I've joked for a while that polling um, is in political world a little bit what sex is for preteens. Okay, <laughs> which is they know all the words. And they talk about it a lot, but they have no idea what they're talking about, OK? So just because you know the words doesn't mean you know what they mean. And it feels that way a lot of times with polling, which is we know all of the terms, margin of error, and demographics, and cross tabs. But sometimes then we get embarrassed to say, well, I don't really know what that means. But I'm going to, I can't admit to anyone that I don't know what it means. Here's your opportunity uh, to ask these fine folks the questions that you have been, you, you know, you may not even appreciate that you've had them, but be willing to, to ask them now. We're going to start off, though, with a uh, sort of a bigger picture look at polling writ large. Mike Basilis is going to start us off. And start us off also answering the question that maybe many of you are already thinking about or have heard about or asking each other, what the hell happened in 2016? Weren't the polls all wrong then? Why should we trust them now? So Mike, you can start us off with good. your presentation. Very good. Thank you. What happened is where we'll go with uh, some of the data you're about to see. But I'd also like to share with you some headlines that I've collected over time. And Joel and everyone here should appreciate some of these headlines, particularly when we talk about political races. In uh, 2008, <laughs> I was asked by a reporter who was on a deadline, what's going to happen on Tuesday? Uh, and uh, I said, well, you know, I'm not really polling in the Democrat race between Hillary Clinton and Barack <laughs> Obama. But let me tell you, and I've been trying to get this in, in quote uh, in a story for a long time. I said, Gardner, I think this race is going to hinge on who turns out. <laughs> you know, typing away. Well, can, what, can you add to that? Well, not only is this race going to hinge on who turns out, but how many of them? <laughs> that's great. That's great. And he went on. And so uh, we can do better than this. As a matter of fact, I think the editor, Rich Apple, woke up and saw this in the print edition. And he said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and you won't find it on the electronic edition if you go search for it. <laughs> So uh, how close was the public polling in 2016? Um, and Lee can talk a lot about this. But I think the narrative may have been a little bit off. But both Joel and I, our internal polls showed things a lot closer, real, real similar in some ways to the real clear politics averages and some of the trends that Joel will show. I'm just looking at the final collection of polls in some of these states. Mm -hmm. Look at Florida. Florida was very close. Mm -hmm. Colorado was one of the states I was working. I had Colorado and Arizona for the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, Georgia was very close. I was a little bit off. Mm -hmm. uh, the actual results in the differential is in the red, and the blue is the real clear politics differential. Mm -hmm. Michigan was mm -hmm. off a few points, mm -hmm. but still very close. Nevada was close. New Hampshire, mm -hmm. North Carolina, yeah. Ohio was like mm -hmm. Iowa. It was a little bit more off. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, the public polls showed about mm -hmm. a two-point mm -hmm. edge for Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. But as we know, Trump edged out there. Virginia was very close. Mm -hmm. And the other one that might have been a little bit off was Wisconsin. But 
one of the things Joe and I were just talking about before we came up on stage is that there was not a lot of data towards the end in Wisconsin. I think the uh, second yeah. of November was sure. the last time. And then you start to see things about maybe some votes were being parked. And what I mean by that is if you look at Johnson and Stein, the Libertarian and Green candidates, mm -hmm. the final results show them mm -hmm. underperforming what they were getting in any of the polls. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with different ways to ask questions about where people may be voting or how they may not be discussing their vote publicly. So we came up with a question, do you know somebody voting for Donald Trump but won't say so publicly? And I told the team, we need to ask that about Hillary because we've never asked that before. Mm -hmm. And so like in Florida, there was a higher percentage of people saying they knew people voting for Trump but wouldn't say so publicly than for Hillary Clinton. But in both these cases, look at how Johnson and Stein overperform mm -hmm. on the public polling and the, and the averages from Real Clear Politics relative to the final results. So that's one of the issues. Now, here's one of the things that I You're think You're not going to read all of this, are you? No. No, oh, okay. <laughs> no. Only the third this part. is the thing we need to look at, Joel, when it says, see methodological <laughs> details here. Okay. When people ask me, they, they think it's Mike Basilis, the polling police, you've got you to blow this poll up. What do you want me to do? Well, let's look at the details. And when the details are available, we learn a lot. We learn how this poll was done 65% cell phone. That's expensive, and that was nice to see. And so when you look at the headline that ABC Washington Post put out the day before the election in 2016, they say the race is still close. They have 47-43 Clinton over Trump. But one of the things that was overlooked was not the difference between the number of Democrats and Republicans, which we'll get back to, but Trump was actually winning in their poll the independents. Mm -hmm. Clinton has a 90% chance. This is early mm. Tuesday morning on the election, 3 a.m. Mm. Eastern time. That's where the narrative may have been wrong. Everyone starts getting on the same reporting bandwagon, and they're not really understanding some of the data. Here's one thing that Joel and I have to deal with in the future. We actually had to deal with it somewhat in 2018, but certainly in 2020. Hillary Clinton and her margins were pretty similar to what Barack Obama had done in uh, 20, 2008 and 2012. What I mean by that, if you look at those blue bars in 28 and 2012, Hillary Clinton's 179,000 margin of victory in the uh, Philadelphia suburbs of Bucks, Chester, Delaware, and Montgomery County, and I was raised in Delaware County, is right in line with what Barack Obama had done. And then you look at the margin of victory for Democratic candidates uh, going back, can I go back? I can go back one. She's a little bit behind Barack Obama, but certainly has a nice cushion from Philadelphia <clears throat> County. Now, look at the rest of the state. The other 62 counties. The last time a Republican won the state was 88. Uh, that was Bush against Dukakis. And you see, even times when George W. Bush was winning his elections, he was, he, he was winning those counties, but not enough to win the state. Come along and you see Trump wins those same counties by 700,000 votes. Now we have a situation. We have two different turnout models. We have a southeastern Philadelphia yeah. area turnout model that looks like 2012, yeah. but the rest of the state looks like 2014, and pollsters don't like that. We generally have one model. Now we might have to have regional models to look at, and that's a consideration. And then just a little bit about reporting information and understanding, again, the demographics and the data. I like this one. Fox News poll storms erode Trump's ratings. This is October 25th of 2017, and they now have his job approval at 38%. So let's look at the poll results. And we dig down, and we can see his job approval over time. And then you overlay that with how many Democrats and Republicans are in the survey, and you can see that the differential in this poll, where supposedly Trump's job approval was uh, slipping away a little bit because of the storms, is a poll in which there's 12 points more Democrats than Republicans. Well, what is the country? How many more Democrats are there than Republicans? Are there more Republicans than Democrats? If you're Scott Rasmussen, you may think there, sometimes there are more Republicans than Democrats. <laughs> I don't think that. I think there's more Democrats than Republicans nationwide, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But there's no other poll that had that number of Democrats or Republicans. Maybe it wasn't the storms. Just don't assume that. Maybe it's the data in the poll. So we want to know as pollsters that something's really causing a change, affecting a change in job approval numbers or the candidate's ballot numbers, not the demographics. 
What is the partisanship of the nation? A couple ways you can look at this that are kind of interesting. Look at the race, um, uh, the last two presidentials. The average of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama in 1216 is 49.65. Trump and Mitt Romney, 46.65. That's a three-point differential. In 2015 and 2016, Gallup has tens of thousands of polls where they at least track party ID. That's off of adult surveys, not voter surveys. Mm -hmm. But it comes down to about a three-point differential. Here's how I tend to look at the nation. There are three points more Democrats than Republicans. It may be trending closer to four points now. The Northeast is clearly more Democratic than Republican. If I had a poll that had more Republicans than Democrats in the Northeast, you would question it. You should, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. The Southeast, pretty even. The, the uh, South Central, more Republican. The Mountain States leans Republican. And of course, the West Coast is more Democratic than Republican. We know that. And so these numbers here that I use are an average of presidential races for national surveys and the tens of thousands of uh, surveys that were conducted by Gallup. Last thing. Beto O'Rourke says the latest polls show he's uh, running even. Now, this is September of 2017. He was not known yet. He hadn't been through a, the primary or anything. He's running even at 30%. I thought it was interesting. They asked, who would you vote for, or haven't you thought enough about it? <laughs> well, if you dig into these numbers, this is a poll that has 27% Republican, 32% Democrat. I've done a lot of polling in Texas. I never had a poll with more Democrats than Republicans in Texas. It's about a nine point, eight to nine point Republican advantage. But if you believe that the state is all of a sudden five points more Democrat than Republican, then maybe better work is tied with Cruz at that time. So they quoted me on this. These are very important things to understand. It all goes back to demographics because in the end, the race could hinge on who turns out. <laughs> and, and who has the most votes, both and, of those. Oh, and, and who, yeah, who yeah. gets the most that votes. Helps. Sometimes that matters, too. Yeah. Both those things. So um, I'm going to show some slides, too, fewer than that, but I want to talk about my overall perspective first. Um, I'm the only person on this panel who was a journalist before he was a pollster. Um, and I believe that journalists have unique talents that actually apply to polling. We do the same thing, believe it or not. You try to ask provocative, interesting questions to elicit unusual, new information in your answers and then stitch it all together in a compelling story. I believe that's the best use of polling. And the thing that I want to talk to all of you about as you're going to get ready to go cover this campaign is that, and I preach this at my firm, and Axe, who's sitting here, knows it, even though to him the horse race is always the most important number. <laughs> <laughs> I could show you a string of emails at midnight that say so. <laughs> Numbers. <laughs> uh, but the truth is, at my firm, I tell people the horse race is rarely the most important number in a poll. Because what I want to know is if the horse race, whether it's staying the same, whether it's going up or down, I want to know the story behind the data in the poll. Mm -hmm. And we ask our questions. We're, our polls are longer than what you see from Marist. We're going in depth about a range of issues that we think could be affecting the environment. And as journalists, you have that same skill. But right now in your profession, and I say this, I've said it publicly, there is an obsession with the horse race. And I will tell you that I don't believe the horse race is news. You know, the first lesson I learned when I went into a newsroom, and I was older than most of you when I started, I, it was a second career for me, was, the definition of news is pretty simple, right? Dog bites man is not news. Man bites dog, that's news, right? <laughs> to me, the horse race is not news Does that day. relate to your first career, the canine biting Well, thing? no, no, okay, no that okay. was beer, okay. <laughs> but my point is, is that, and, and this reflects what Mike was just saying, if you looked at the averages and the trends that were going on, instead of reporting on the horse race of the day in 2016, and these are the three states that broke the blue wall. We had won these in six out of seven, uh, six out of six elections in a row. Breaking these three states is what cost us the Electoral College, right? But if you look in particular at Michigan and Pennsylvania, over the last three weeks out, and we averaged the polls for three weeks, two weeks, and one week, a distinct trend line in two of those three states where the margin was shrinking as we got closer to election day. Never a good sign for a campaign. You want to be going into election day with momentum. This was easily discernible, right? Wisconsin, there was a lot less polling, as Mike said, in the last few weeks, so it's a little bit harder to say. So the thing that I think colored a lot of coverage that journalists react to and that voters react to, and this gets to the third party voters also, is probability forecasting. Mm -hmm. And from a news perspective, it's terrible. As a consumer, by the way, I love probability forecasting. I think Nate Silver's brilliant. 
but I think it is the antithesis of news, and it is destructive to the political process. We are not betting on horses. We are not betting on basketball. And when you tell people there is a 78% probability that Hillary Clinton is going to win on Tuesday, a whole lot of people in these three states could go vote third party feeling comfortable that Hillary Clinton would win. But guess what? We lost these three states by 77,000 votes in total and 660,000 people across those three states voted for third party candidates, Johnson and Stein. So, you know, think about this from a journalistic perspective. When a poll comes out, is there really news in there that's worth reporting? Just because it says poll on the press release or so-and-so leads doesn't make it news. Can I ask how many people here have written or participated in a story about the conflict between the left and the center in the Democratic primary? Show of hands, how many? How many have read those kinds of stories? Everybody. How many here have, have written or participated in stories saying there's a tension between the left, right, and center on the Republican side? Handful. How many have read stories like that? Yeah. Some. So I've always preached that to win elections in this country, you have to win the middle. Neither party has a dominant uh, 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 place. And the fight and the dialogue we're having now about these tensions between left and center and right and center are being, I think, more exaggerated than they should be, particularly in terms of the Democratic field. But if you look here, some data from 2004 through 2018, and as I hear stories about which party is struggling with the center, and I look at the results from these elections, and you can see a pretty gaping margin between Democrats and Republicans on who's winning moderate <laughs> voters. There are only a couple of times here where they get within about double digits uh, from Republicans in all of these national elections. When they do get closer in 10, in 14, et cetera, in four is when they do gain, and when they don't, they lose. I went the wrong direction. OK. Now, where is this tension coming from? In the late 90s, the Republican Party, and here's part of the story of the data here. The Republican Party made a pact with the Christian coalition to be its organizing arm. They wanted something that would rival labor unions on the Democratic side, and they found that white evangelicals were very active, were educated, could be mobilized to vote, and they combined with Ralph Reed and the coalition to get people out to vote, and they started courting evangelicals for part of their base. The white evangelicals comprised 24% of the country. That's it. But Republicans dominate. If you look at that red line, they win about 75%, let's say, on average, right? That converts to 18 points in a national election. That means, among all others, they have to get to about 42 points just to get to 50%. And you can see in the bottom chart from 2014, they have rarely done that. They have an increasingly difficult time getting to voters in the middle. And whether or not it's because of the white evangelical base that they've built up that alienates other voters or not. I can't say there's a cause and effect there, but if you're putting all your chips in what is the most right-wing element of your party, you're going to alienate voters in the middle. If you look at the makeup of the electorate, back in 2004 on the left, if you look at that, moderates were a plurality. They were 45% of the electorate. Conservatives were 34, liberals at 21. So now, here we are, 2018. Right? 14 years later, conservatives are still a plurality, but barely. They've lost eight points. They're now 37% of the self-IDing voters. Conservatives are 36%, and liberals are 27. So moderates have lost eight points, but six of those eight points now identify as Democrat, and only two of those eight points identify as Republican. So again, in a narrative about the left-center tension in the Republican Party, if you look into data, and all this data is available from exit polls and anywhere else, if you look into this, there isn't a tension there. There may be people competing from the left and center wings of their party, but that is not the dominant story, nor should it be the, the, the dominant narrative, because what it's doing is it's polluting the environment in the Democratic primary, that there's this basic ideological conference that's plaguing the party when there is a bigger problem with Republicans getting to win the center than there has been of Democrats winning the center. And lastly, if you look at, I've already showed you that we tend to win moderates, we looked at one last group, ideological crossers. These are conservatives who vote with Democrats or liberals who vote with Republicans. And what you see here is that there are the blue lines show more conservatives vote with Democrats than liberals who vote with Republicans. 
So I'm showing you all this not to talk about one particular story. What I'm showing you all this for is because I believe journalists come to the table with that curiosity, mm -hmm. with the knowledge of the political landscape, and the ability to challenge people with hard questions. The toughest journalists in the room love it when you, you know, ask tough questions. I know that. I feel really good when I feel I've gotten somebody to say something, not that they don't want to say, but that they may not have wanted to admit, right? They make a story for you sometimes when they do that. And your job should never be to tell people who's winning and who's losing. Your job should be to tell people the story beneath the polling. And you should work on that. And you should hammer guys like Lee Miringoff to dig deeper into their data. And I say that as because I pass the baton to him. Me many times. When I was a journalist, <laughs> I learned from polling from Lee Miringoff who in the 80s was handing out little blue binders with his polls in them. Binders full of numbers. Binders full of numbers, <laughs> yes. Correct, thank you. But I kept just asking him more and more questions as a journalist to understand the polling. And that was my foundation when I went into polling a few years later, was talking to him over and over again to make sure I understood stuff and cut through the BS that campaigns and people like Mike are going to feed you. I would never do that. Uh -uh. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, campaigns are going to try to give you the best spin on the data that they can, right? So you've got to find ways to cut through it. Go look at cross tabs. Ask the pollsters for them. Read the top lines. Don't just rely on the horse race. One last story. I got to tell you, I did Bob Menendez's race in New Jersey, right? You've all heard of Senator Menendez, right? Had been indicted, went on trial. We were hammered all the way through. He was, you know, cleared in the trial, hung jury, all the charges dismissed, got censured during the campaign by a bipartisan committee in the Senate. Every story, every story that came out with polls would talk about Senator Menendez running for re-election under a cloud of ethics. Every single story. <laughs> We were outspent by about $40 million to 10, and we won by 10 points in New Jersey, a blue-leaning state, no question about it, a blue state. But not once, not once did anybody look inside the polls that showed that pharmaceutical CEOs had a lower favorable rating than Washington politicians. People in America hate pharmaceutical companies today. Their approval ratings as an industry are at about 27%. And all we did was against resistance from some Washington um, leaders who wanted us to make the election all about Trump all the way through, we said no. This guy jacked up the prices on cancer drugs when he knew patients had no other choice. We're going to keep hammering on that record, and we'll close on Trump. And that's what we did, and we won by 10 points. So now goes to my goes mentor, to, to our one of my mentors, Lee yes. Miringoff. If you don't well like done. Joel Benenson, I'm guilty as charged. Yes. I remember Joel Benenson before he was Joel Benenson. Well, sort of. Um, Amy, can I just sort of jump in and Please pick up do. some pieces? Please do, yes. And, uh, and just to, re to emphasize this point, these guys aren't going to give you their numbers. This guy you will see his numbers, and you already have. So yes. OK. So um, all right, so let me, let me just pick up on a couple comments and I had other stuff. I'm, not, I'm the only academician up here, and they come in with charts. OK, mm -hmm. and I, I, I should have pointers and chalk and erasers and all that. I don't have any of that. Um, so all right, on public polls, Amy's right. A lot of it has to do with sex, OK? <laughs> Timing. Uh. <laughs> OK, because. Some of the stuff that was going on in 2016, Donald Trump is a great closer. And in the last week, and whether you was Comey, not Comey, or whatever you wanted to say, you know, we saw it in 2018 when he went out again. I mean, so the polls that had some problems, and there were some in the public polls that had some problems, they might have been done a little too early. And that makes sense, because the stuff is expensive. So I just wanted to say that. I would also point out, and I, I, I don't think, Mike, you were going the, the, to down this road, but I thought you might when you're talking about Wisconsin. One of the things that came out after the election because people thought the polls blew it, we'll talk about that in a second, which you've already intimated that was not really the issue was, um, was the notion that Trump outperformed the public polls because of the shy Trump right. voter. Right. Okay, now, I don't know if, how many of you people as reporters talk to Trump voters. Okay, Trump, about him. Trump voters are not shy, okay? <laughs> they like Trump. He could go out on Fifth Avenue, da, da, da. We all know about that. The polls that, you know, had that gap were polls that ended perhaps early, or they just weren't very good polls. There's a lot of possibilities. So, okay, so that's a couple things. How am I going to do 41 years of polling in 41 seconds? Let me talk fast. I'll yes. talk fast? Yes, okay. I think right. you just give us a, give us a yeah. sense, Lee, of when yeah. your poll comes out, 
yep. what you are trying to do okay. and what these fine folks should do with okay. those, okay. that data that you're presenting. Okay. So first off, the, I was in, you know, watching some of the panels earlier today, and there was a lot of discussion about the polls, which for me is the equivalent of discussing the media. <laughs> and no one here would think that there is the media, and people who do polling see all the nuances in good polls and bad polls, different methods. Right now, for a lot of reasons, mostly cost, um, a lot of organizations are moving away from live interviewers to online. There's a whole variety of good polls, the good, bad, and the ugly when it comes to public polls. Um, so I think that's, that's important. It's sort of like right now, as Joe was talking about, polls are something that journalists feel, you know, it's hard to live with them, but it's certainly hard to live without them. And maybe you can sort of live with them and sort of live without them is a, probably a better place to, uh, to be positioned. I want to also, and I'll say one more comment and I'll get into yes. your question. I promise to answer your question. I was very um, uh, pleased to see uh, a whole new generation of journalists out there because as some of us move up in years, we always wonder about what's going to follow. And today is a great example of, uh, of, all, all, of all of you folks. Uh, um, all right, so I was going to tell you another funny thing, but I'm going to let that go. Let me see. <laughs> I'll talk. Um, all right, so the polls come out. Let me tell you one thing about the prognosticators. Yes. Um, 2012, uh, 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 um, Silver at, um, Nate. Uh, Nate Silver at Real yeah. Clear um, sort of came up with this notion of putting probability models together and prognosticating and coming up with like he does with basketball games. And then by 2016, everybody wanted to get one of these things. Right. Okay, so we saw this huge cottage industry of predicting, which Joe alluded to, that Hillary Clinton was going to win by, I think, as low as 71% chance and as high as 98% chance. And that really had an effect. Let me tell you that those were not polls. None of those people do polls. They took the polls, threw them through their models and special sauce, and came up with the conclusion that Hillary Clinton was likely to win and the likely was really hard. Now, if you're told that it's going to rain, and you, it's 80% uh, chance it's going to rain, like today, and you bring your umbrella, like I did, and it doesn't rain, you don't really care. <laughs> On the other hand, if it's a 20% chance, <laughs> and you don't bring the umbrella, and it does rain, then you're yeah. pretty annoyed. Yeah. Well, that's sort of what happened with these. We were hearing a lot about the likelihood that Hillary Clinton was going to win from all these prognosticators. They're going to be back. Okay, don't get caught into right. the notion that there is a certain probability of rain or not rain or whoever's going to win or is not going to win. All right, so we do a poll. You guys know mostly what the margin of error is. All polls are estimates. Uh, there's a range. No, the polls don't have the scientific precision that the numbers suggest. If you ever see a poll with a decimal point, that's like nuts. Okay, so you... you uh, uh, so you have these polls, and they, they do have a, a, this range. Um, and so if, and I'll just one sentence, if Donald Trump's approval rating is 42%, and the error margin is plus or minus 3, that means, in theory, that had you interviewed everybody, it would have been 42 minus 3, 39, or 42 plus 3, 45. So that's what it would have been theoretically. It's an allowable range. Margin of error is not an error. It's misunder, uh, mistermed, <laughs> and it's also misused so that you see change very often reported when it isn't a real change based strictly on the margin of error. Uh, Morning Consult did a, a poll the other day, and it had, uh, uh, it was written up, uh, yeah, no, first of all, it's on the Democratic primaries, and you're seeing some polls really early, talk about not being meaningful in terms of toss-ups. I mean, this is like so early with that, with horse races for the Democratic primary. But they had in this poll the headline, good news for Buttigieg, I can't even pronounce it, and Harris, that's it, declines for Biden and Sanders. It's a poll showing Biden going from 35 to 33, and the hard to pronounce guy going from two to three, <laughs> which is, and that got play. I mean, you know he's surging, you've heard that, okay? This is part of, of the surge. Um, so we put it out that what goes into the making of the poll, what's the sausage, is not just a statistical margin of error, 
Although we're in, shouldn't it be bratwurst? We're in Chicago. It's sausage? Yes. Okay. All right. It could be sausage also in Chicago, too. Um, but it's a whole bunch of other things. The other panelists alluded to this. So it's how you pick the sample, how you word the questions, the question order, uh, the quality of the interviewing if you have live interviewers doing this, the clarity of the presentation if you're doing it online, how you weight and adjust the d data based on the results you get. As was said, if you get a poll, it doesn't look, make a lot of sense. It may not make a lot of sense. It may be badly rebalanced in terms of the sample and ultimately how the poll is written. So are you getting this in terms of the toss-ups? Are you getting it in terms of a lot of other things? I would point out that the polls, as, as Joe pointed out, I think, are best served serving you guys and the public if they provide some kind of narrative. So we have toss-up polls already on the Democratic sweepstakes. But here's what we've learned from the public polls, which have to do with a narrative about what the race is right. that don't have a lot to do, OK, with the, with, with the horse race. We've learned, and I've already adjusted my thinking on this, that there doesn't appear to be a home court advantage for these Democrats. So I was thinking they got 35 candidates, and they cover 35 states. And all they have to do is hold their own state, and we're never going to have a, anybody with a, a majority at the convention. But it turns out. Jill Brand isn't doing well in New York. Warren isn't doing well in Massachusetts. Kamala Harris isn't doing that great in California. So we're learning a little bit about that as, as part of a narrative, no guarantee. We know from Donald Trump all about his base, and we know about sort of like those numbers he has going in. We know what his reelect question is. It's in the low to mid 40s, not a great number now, that, that presumably has something to do, but we want to know what the approval rating is in those states, particularly the states that Joe was uh, talking about. We know that Biden and Bernie uh, are doing well, and we know that it's not just name recognition, because other people have name recognition and are not, are not doing as well, um, but it may have to do with comfort level and familiarity as these people, are they acceptable as your party's nominee, and that may be some convincing the others have to do. But we know also don't rely on one characteristic from a poll. Because at the very same time Biden and, and, and uh, Bernie Sanders are doing well, Democrats are also telling us they want someone under 50. So there's a little in, uh, incongruity there. Can I jump in for a second? Absolutely. That's Save where me. I, that's where I fundamentally disagree. With me? I think that With Biden me? and Bernie is largely name ID. OK. I do. I think. You're yeah. right. It is a massive field. People yeah. have barely gotten okay. to know these voters, okay. and I think it feeds a narrative. In fact, in December, Ann Selzer, who was supposed to be on this panel at one point, I think, was she? I don't know. I don't know. She had a poll mm -hmm. in Iowa in December, more than a year out from the caucuses, and the poll said Sanders-Biden lead, largely because of name ID. <laughs> To which I think, yeah, and sunshine will make your garden grow. Like, yeah, tell me okay. something I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I mean, they are the most known. They've both run and been national figures but for then, longer. Then why Mr. Benenson does Jill Brand do lousy in New York? That's a different. Does lousy in Massachusetts? That's a different question. They're known. That's well, I, they are known, but it's a different question. Okay. I think you have to look at you're looking at President of the United States, okay. the people they know and associate on the national scene, Biden and Bernie have both run for president. Yeah. Biden was vice president. He was out there for eight mm -hmm. years in a way, and Bernie was out there for a wonderful campaign that he ran mm -hmm. from out of nowhere and has a massive base of people that carries with him from that. Yep. Yep. OK, yep. so part of it's name ID. Okay. And the rest of them, yeah, they're all in single digits. Yeah. But I think it's way too early yeah. to say no. it's anything other than one name ID. One more point ID. on we that. have yeah. barely started the campaign. I agree. One more, one more point on that, and then I'll give yeah, it yeah, back yeah. to you and, and you we'll can give questions. it to them yes, and yes, yes. we're doing very well. Yes. We're, we're okay, you... what's your one more point? Well, one more point is in April <laughs> <laughs> in April of uh, of 2015, which was exactly the same time as we four were year. 4 years yeah. ago, we had a panel in Washington at Maris. You were on the panel. Uh-oh. Do you remember? No. Okay. <laughs> was that, was that I, I'm saying that as a it was, it was plausible the, deniability it was the deca for it was one thing that I say. House. So the panel was Steve Thomas, head of the White House Correspondents Association, Susan Page, who a lot of you people probably know, Chuck Todd, who probably some of you also know, and Amy, who, if you didn't know, you should, because yeah, that's important. And I look back at the tape. This uh -oh. is April, this week, next week, four years ago, right in the same cycle. Two people weren't mentioned in that panel, which we didn't ask about. You didn't mention them either. 
Donald Trump and Bernie, and Bernie Sanders, Sanders. Yeah. which goes to Joel's point, this is awfully early. That's right. And I, I'm done. Okay. You are done. Okay. <laughs> We have two minutes, so start thinking about the questions you'd like to ask. You know the drill. I want to ask you guys another question that um, these folks might be getting to, which is they get information uh, on a poll, or you're getting uh, polling data, and their bosses say, well, how do we know that that's a real poll? What is your definition of a quality poll? And is it, and does, uh, how much do you look at the mode that's used. Phones, internet, robo-dials, which is you're getting, you know, that's where you press the phone, press one for this, press two for this, versus talking to somebody live. Mike, do you want to well, start well, with that? On, on the process, the robocalls can only go to landlines. Right. And so you're really cutting out the increasingly important part of who we interview, and that's cell People phones. People on cell phones, that's right. Uh, when I started this business 30 years ago this past week, I remember the phone shop at the Terrence Group were very concerned. We were going from one and a half refusals to two refusals for every completed interview. <laughs> now we have 14 or 15 right. refusals. We, were, we took 15 dials to get one complete back then. Right now it's and a now 6%. It's 120. There's a 6% response and so, rate. Uh, so fortunately, we have these different modes. We're, we're actually also blending online surveys. And so do you think that makes it better, or is it that you haven't figured out quite no, well, yet you, how I'm to have, make it We're finding it a too. difficult time doing all internet survey because the panelists aren't there that are representative. Right, yeah. They tend to be right. too educated, too Anglo. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a problem. Um, and not old enough, and, maybe. Yeah, they tend to be younger. Uh, so you have to look at a lot of this. We, we dialed. Bottom line, so if it's an internet poll only, that's when you don't want to like put a lot of stock. That, that can be an issue. That, that can be a real issue, but it goes back to the demographics. How representative, so there's a lot of ways to conduct the surveys, but in the end, how representative are the respondents of the electorate? And that's what I look at. Uh, and I'm, I'm asked by some of my office holders that are running for re-election, what does this poll look like? Is this right? Does this make sense? Well, let's look at the demographics first. From how, a but for, that, a, but a, for a normal point. person who doesn't know a what the demographics- <laughs> okay, journalists. No, you mean journalists well, but but, but right? even journalists yeah. saying, yeah. okay, how, we should know the demographics of the state based on what the previous election, so, the census data. What would you no, I, here's, get, here's get them to do? Here's my approach: is if you if you're looking at a particular state and we're talking about. Right, let's say we're doing the Iowa poll. Right, Iowa polls are coming out. South talking Carolina about polls are coming. Yeah, that's a lot different. Than okay, fine. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> See? Fine, See? fine, fine, fine. Talk about New South Hampshire. South Carolina no, and New okay. Hampshire. Fine. Okay? You have, Primary polls are coming you know, out every you, other day. So what you have to do if you're a pollster is you've got to look at the confluence of data you can assemble. Some of it comes from exit polls, from previous primaries, for example. Mm -hmm. You can examine very much um, what the turnout has been. You take a state like New Hampshire where people can same day walk in and identify yeah. as a uh, 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 Democrat and get a Democratic ballot and then walk out and re-register right there on the spot. And when we did New Hampshire back in 2008, we looked at how many people walk out and immediately re-register because knowing who a pure independent was was very important to us, right? And we found that about 40% of the people who go in independent come back out and re-register as independent afterwards. So that was a different type of voter from a Democratic primary voter, right? They were going in, they were choosing a ballot. Maybe it was because Hillary Clinton was in the race, maybe Barack Obama was. So there are myriads of questions and there's a lot of data available to you to tell you what an electorate should look like in a state, in a primary, based on past history, and you have to see how it's changing and what the trends are. And there is an art that goes along with the science of constructing a sample that will replicate mm -hmm. your sample uh, that reflects the electorate as it is. And that takes a lot of work. It takes more work now. I mean, Mike's in the business a lot longer than I am. I'm only in 25 years, he's in 30 years. But it Just takes a lot more work now than it did on the first presidential campaign I worked on in 1996. And people weren't being polled. Well, that's what I worry about. Are we gonna get less accurate polling because the bar for entry now, ironically, is lower because you can use the internet, but it's higher to do high quality yes, polling. Yes, you're gonna get a lot more polling, which means there's gonna be 
good polling, but it's going to be more diffuse, which is why, um, and I know some of the numbers here came from a place like Real Clear Politics, and everybody looks at it to kind of do, but they take a lot of different things. It's sort of like an average of apples, oranges, pears, bananas, and they put the whole thing together, and it's a good kind of quick hand, but it, you may want to follow a couple reputable polls over time like uh, that have a track record. I mean, Silver's 538 has ratings of pollsters. If, you know, Maris poll comes out, you can look us up. We could have an A, we could have an F. You know, you can look at it. Obviously, I'm using an example. I think you know which the answer is. But you could, you could check that out, and that may help you sort out a internet poll or even a yes. good live interviewer poll because there's though I'm sorry bad one there are a lot of those and they may not be great because of all those art reasons that uh, that Joel but we also about. have data in some states that are party registration states Colorado is yeah. about three points more Democratic than Republican in terms of registration but in 2016 they were very close in terms of the percentage of Republicans and Democrats that turned out we know that we know a lot about turnout we know it, and it's if you go back to the clicker uh, yeah, it, here you go. I don't know how you get back now. If we just go back, I think it was at the base of this story. <laughs> yeah. I, I said here in this poll that had five points more Democrats than Republican and better work was tied when nobody knew him. Our surveys have shown an eight to ten point Republican advantage or Democrats in terms of partisan vote behavior. Where do we get that? I don't just base that on past polls. We know the base Republican and the base Democrat vote in Texas. And it comes out to about that differential. You can look at races. This is work on your part, but ask a pollster. Well, what did you base your, your right. number That's and your percentage thing. of Republicans and Democrats? Right. And you get that over time, or is this changing? Because once I get into an election, we don't want to see a lot of variability within that election. In Texas, we were off by one one hundredth on Better Works' final outcome. We had data up through election eve. What you do with data on Monday night, I don't know, except make a better <laughs> prediction. And, and um, we got to within one one hundredth of a point but it's all based on knowing this differential. Right. The Republicans turned out, the Democrats turned out at their base levels, the independents that Joel was talking about, moderates in the middle, made the difference. Because right. younger, urban suburban independents were going for better work at over 20, 30 points. And that, that is what, what we're what looking at again. You have to look at all that. But even, the, um, even the, uh, the article goes on to say that by their own calculation, there was an average of 14.8 percentage points across seven races that they looked at and the railroad commission, six judicial posts that are statewide. So that reporter actually dug in and looked at the vote behavior of the state to learn, yeah, what's, does this poll make sense? Right. Um, I want to let you all, if anyone has questions, to come on up. And we can start right now. Fantastic. Go right ahead. Thank Hi. you. Um, I'm Mary Ellen Kloss. I'm with the Miami Herald. And being in a state with hurricanes, um, we have a lot of forecasting. And, um, and one of the things that we never do is put a pinpoint and say, this is where the hurricane will land. We have a cone of probability. There you go. Um, so one of the things that I've, I've wondered is, should we as journalists be presenting polls as a cone of probability and saying, Give us the context of what that looks like. Or is that a bad I, idea? Can so, I? Tell me. Tell me sorry, Lee. No, go on. I, I have another fundamental question. Should you be reporting on polls at all? Oh, please. Well, that hurts. You've got to have that. Why? Because well, we don't want to listen just to you guys doing your private polls exactly. that you plan your strategy so on fine. that the public doesn't get to see. I didn't say I didn't say you shouldn't poll. <laughs> I didn't say it's you shouldn't living. poll. It's a living. It's a living. I said, why do you report on polls? There would be nothing wrong if your organization is going to conduct polls. Why not do it for the benefit of journalists? It informs the readers not a whit unless you're really doing the kind of polling that creates a story that's no, meaningful no, no. About the dynamics of the election. If all you're going to do is do a poll so that you can put out Miami Herald says Trump yeah, leads by doing. three, that's not creating news. And I'm not I'm not objecting to creating news, but make it news that's valuable to your readers and meaningful to them. This is news, a trend. Yeah. So so I agree. Yeah, but how are you going to get a trend if you don't have the public polls? Why rely on you can't me? have a trend if you oh, don't have polls. Why rely on me I can telling rely on you? <laughs> why rely on me telling you my public polls, but you can't print the numbers? That's not being transparent at all. Give the public the reason behind, but don't 
ignore the timing, the context, and all the other parts that go into, into the ingredient, because then you're not doing anything beyond the numbers. I think the, I, I, I think the reporters have done a good job putting out the mm -hmm. margin of error. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's all they get. 95% confidence level. That means if we did this poll yeah. at the same time, 20 <laughs> times, 19 out of 20 times, we would be within plus or minus 3% if that's a sample of 1,000, or 4% if it's a sample of 600. I think most of the time that when we see stories, the, the press has been really good about putting that information in there somewhere. Yeah. But the public has a perception that, yes. that that's right. we've, yes, we've, we picked don't. A, we've picked a place. And I guess I'm wondering, from your you know, perspective, so Can I put a finer point on my answer before? Because right. here, here's what yeah. I really mm -hmm. wanted to get to. So in September or October of 2016, the New York Times did a poll, and they didn't put the horse race in the headline, and it wasn't in the story until the fourth paragraph. Good. And the headline says, with, uh, the poll shows that Trump comes with risks and rewards. And they wrote four paragraphs that really informed readers and I think it was Pat Healy and Dahlia Sussman. Dahlia's in their polling division. Pat's, mm -hmm. It really informed readers about exactly what the Trump dynamic was. They wanted someone who would be a little risky in Washington. They were comfortable with that. So they told readers something that was valuable about the dynamic so in the election. Reporting. So in the Miami Herald poll. That's so reporting I'm, publicly. And I'm saying the final Joe, point is I don't really mean don't yourself. poll. But no, report okay. on them if there's news there and make it valuable to the readers. Yes. Just don't start with we, Sanders and Biden lead. And we, need to be able to talk about, we need to talk about uncertainty. We need to talk about voters who are still up for grabs and right. persuadable. It's not just the undecided. Some people might vote differently or not at all. So there's a lot of things that the poll data has. Uh, the worst thing, though, is to go into the crosstabs and just pull yes. that number out as if that was an entire poll like Donald Trump did only a month ago with our poll, which had him as a high approval rating among Hispanics, and he started talking about the Hispanic number in the Marist poll. It was not a poll on Hispanics, it was a poll, and that was just a cross tab, error margin, plus or minus. What, it was 80 people? Yeah, it was about Something that. Something like that, yeah. Okay, which meant about three people went and changed their mind. So that we talked, we fought back hard, but he's the president and we're just okay. country pollsters All from right. Poughkeepsie. Point taken, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. It's a good question. Mike, I'm also from Delaware County, so, but, but my question is this, and you've showed a couple of these polls. There were national polls about how the race is going. We don't elect a president for, you know, obviously right. through the popular vote. We do it through the Electoral College. Why do pollsters, why do Marist put out national polls in a race that's not going to be determined by you know, everybody voting. I mean, in the end, it's about South Carolina, mm -hmm. Iowa, yeah, California, we do New both. York. We do both, and people are interested in how the country is going. But isn't it about, the, yeah. how much, can you tell these folks how much it costs to do a poll well, in a state? Let's go to a swing state in yeah. September and what it would cost you to do a poll in if Pennsylvania. If you hire them, it'll cost you a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it probably costs us about twenty to $25,000 to do a state poll. Okay, so twenty five grand to do one poll. And to do national polls, the same? Yeah, same. Okay. So if you want to do five state polls versus one national poll. You raise tuition. But again, doesn't it? That was a joke. That was a joke. But is that, but, but I, no, I'm not, I don't mean to be saying that to you. I mean to be saying overall, is it a money issue? Is that why we do it? Well, and, yeah, and I, I understand yeah. it's a money issue, but the other part of it is, and getting back to Joel's point, is, it, is, is the national polls throw off the narrative, and I also firmly think threw off the narrative in 2016 mm -hmm. because I'm from South Carolina. I saw what was happening with Trump in South Carolina and the South, but people weren't seeing that because they were seeing national polls that had Hillary ahead by X, and of course we right. know she won the popular vote right. by millions of and votes. And you know, so just, and, and, and historically it's interesting, you know, mm -hmm. when, when George um, W. Bush yep. got elected and won the Electoral College and long lost the popular vote in 2000, uh, it was the first time in not quite 100 years, but almost, mm -hmm. that someone had um, that that had happened. It's now happened twice in this century. Yep. And twice in the last five times. Well, twice. Yeah, exactly. So I'm using this century, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. Twice in the last five times. So um, I think it's a fair point. At the same time, I do think it's not totally useless to have national mm -hmm. polls mm -hmm. if you can extrapolate from them larger stories about the dynamic in the country's electorate again. Mm -hmm. I know I'm sounding like a broken record on this, but I think, you know. As journalists, you want great, interesting stories, right? And you can get that from polls. And if they're telling that and it's on a national level, because the election is run nationally, by the way. Yes, it's run state by state. But in our media environment today, it's, it's national. a national election as well. So, you know, in a campaign, 
Uh, we did poll a universe of battleground states. There are about 12 or 13 that we combine and look at that universe as a whole. Um, but I wouldn't eliminate national polls and just do state polls in a presidential race. I wouldn't do that yeah. either. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nick Garcia with the Denver Post. And this is mostly a question for Joel. What data do you think journalists should be looking at if, if you know, preference polls just are out of the question? What polling data, what data should we be looking at? And what are like specific sources you would reference us to to try to figure out what's going on in the Democratic primary between now and January? So one thing, I, there, it's a great question. And I, I'm, I'm going to answer it one way first. And then um, I think it's way too early to look at any data, by the way, at this point in polling, to be honest with you. We've barely gotten you know, to spring training in this campaign, to be quite honest. They're just longer and longer. Um, but um, what I would say is, and you know, Dan Balls at the Washington Post has been doing this. A couple of other outlets have been doing this. If you do your jobs, if you say, hey, let's go talk to swing voters in Iowa who, uh, or caucus foes on the ground in Iowa. This is a big Democratic field. Let's find out what's on their minds. Who's really cutting through? What are they looking for in a candidate, right? Where do they think the country is? Use your interview techniques. Go, you create great what we call qualitative research, and in some ways it's better than focus groups because you can do it one-on-one -on -one as journalists, and go talk to 25, 35, 40 people. One of the first things I did like this was as a journalist when Mario Cuomo was thinking of running for a fourth term. And I went around the state to three pockets in the state and just talked to people, came back with a story that said the unavoidable governor, that if there was a credible opponent, he'd be in trouble. They asked me to work for him a month later, <laughs> right? And Complained like out. hell about the story, and he lost because he had a credible opponent. People were ready to turn on him, and I captured that as a journalist without ever looking at a poll. It's qualitative data, and that's what you people are great at. Just to push back, but anecdotes are data. And even if you have, you know, 25 or 30, your editors are going to be like, and? Like, where's, where's something to, like, hinge this on? If, Do you if, have any thoughts on that? You know, it's an interesting question. I mean, there are, you know, I mean, as a former journalist, qualitative data matters. We did focus groups over and over again. It is qualitative data. Getting the voice of people hearing their words, by the way, I design my polls off their words. I want to hear their language. Because if you're speaking your language, particularly if you come from inside the Beltway, you are toast. You have to understand not to replay their language, but hear the words they use and how they express their sentiments, or you're not going to make the connection with them that you need to persuade yeah. them. The, and you guys are good at that. The la last question we do with our polls with NPR and PBS is we ask people, when they get done with the interview, would you mind if a reporter wrote out called you and did follow-up questions. So point. then they ask us, give us a bunch of people who voted for Donald Trump who are now voting for Bernie or like Bernie said, and we give them all those names and numbers, and then they call them back. They're the real people from the poll. And, that, and we can do that with any of that. So that's, a, that's sort of like a related part to the Good way Joe does. Well, can should, I add to yeah, that? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. This is very important qualitative information. On the quantitative side, one of the things that you can be looking at in 2020, let's face it, this last election we had was more like a presidential than we'd ever seen yeah. right. throughout your election. Absolutely. 2018 turnout was <clears throat> resembled a presidential. Democrat base vote turned out, Republican base vote turned out. You think they're going to turn out in 2020? Absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. So why, when you look at these polls, look at the, any trend lines like Joel has up here, look and see what's happening with independents. Mm -hmm. yep. You can look at that all day. And, and every poll you look at in a state, that's a battleground state particularly, because we're all interested in about the same 12 to 15 states. Look at those independents. Mm. You could you could report on that all year. Mm. Well, not this year, next year. <laughs> right. Hi, Patricia Lopez with the um, Minneapolis Star Tribune. I agree with everything you said about qualitative data, and I was really glad to hear you say it. But we are going to get a lot of polls thrown at us of varying degrees of quality. And I, I want to go back to, for a minute to how you evaluate those polls, and if you could give us some benchmarks for things like, you know, um, landlines versus cell phone, the optimal size of people that have been polled, some way to evaluate the questions that are asked, because I think the quality of the question matters a lot in determining yeah. the quality. I know of the you poll. have you have three minutes. That's a three credit course. <laughs> I, I got to say, you know what? To do uh, the and, and we're all agreeing the rigor that we have to apply to get make sure that the polling we get is right and that we're confident in it 
it, and I'm saying this with all admiration for the work of journalists, it's not your skill set. It is hard. It is time consuming. You have to know the electorate in each venue and what it looks like. Uh, I, I just don't think it's, there's an easy answer for news organizations. Well, may, maybe not an easy answer, but is there some way, you know, so a way that you can push back on an editor who hands you what you think is a pretty poorly done poll in some way to say, here's what this poll is lacking. We shouldn't report on it. I think the first thing you look at demographics. Might, well, demographics, but I would start with party identification. It's the biggest predictor of how a person's going to vote. Now, with the middle being you know, attenuated, it's going to be, like Mike said, look at independence also, see what the trend is there, if you can pick something up there. But male, female, race, age cohorts, those things are all available in pre-existing data from past mm -hmm. exit polls, you know, and or, you know, if you're familiar with Some the Secretary tournament. of State's report. Yes, yeah, Secretary of but, State's but report. 57% of senior citizens who vote sometimes 58% are female. Why? Where are the men? They're dead, right? They die off. <laughs> wow. 18 to 34 year olds. Sometimes it's 57% female. Where are the guys? They're not civically engaged at all. They're look, looking for the Dorito bag and Monday night football games under the sofa cushion. They're not at all engaged. So women are voting at a higher clip at the younger and older end of the age spectrum. These are things that we should talk about some more. David, maybe what we can do is we can have some kind of a large webinar and we could talk for another hour sometime and we ought to do this for them. I'd be glad, I'd oh. Joe, Lee would too. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's, you, you have, I, I you have sure like five answer. questions that all deserve an answer and we can give yeah. you examples of things to look for. Yeah, I think, I, I, I have an answer. You wanna know, call me, I'll tell you if it's good or not. <laughs> there you go. All right, we have, we have just one and a half minutes so I wanna get okay. as many, That's a great idea. we can get do a quick, lightning round to get the last couple of folks in. Yeah, I'm Christian Tolviso from the UNC School of Media and Journalism. On that demographic line, I was wondering if you have any advice on native versus non-native populations, especially in states like North Carolina, where in Wake County we're seeing 60 new residents a day. Mm -hmm. you, you just asking the question, were yeah. you born and raised in this Guide, state? Guidance for how you, as a journalist, can couple polling with the emergence of new populations mm. into an area that might not fit past yeah, context. You can ask how ask long, him. just have a question that says, how long have you lived in the state? If you're designing a poll, how yeah. long have you lived here? For some people, you, you may know how long they've been registered. You may see them having registered recently. That doesn't necessarily comport with residents, though. Yeah. yeah. Good, thank you. John? I just wanted to come say hi to Amy. No, thank seriously. You. Uh, John Ralston from the Nevada Independent. This is like one of my biggest pet peeves, and, and, I, and I started this news organization. We decided that if Joel Benenson sends us a campaign memo, when they, they love releasing these memos, right? And, they, and, they, and they're always so great for their candidates, right? Uh, and, and so we don't run those. And so we, we, I've, I've written, I wrote a piece saying that we are only going to run poll results if the campaign or the special interest or whoever it is, is willing to send us the entire instrument, even if we can't use it all, so we know that the poll is not skewed in some way. I don't understand why all journalism organizations won't do that. I mean, we are naturally, because of what we do, ravenous for information, for data, we love seeing it. But we shouldn't run all of them. And we shouldn't uh, be part of the pack and run them just because everybody else is. Not that any of you would ever do bad polls or skewed polls. I'm not suggesting such a thing. But the other point that you made, Joel, which is right, is often the horse race number is the least interesting yeah. number. And journalists need to learn what, what to look for in the internals and ask for the cross tabs because that will tell you whether it's a good or bad poll. And I come from the state probably where the worst polling the last few cycles has yep. existed. Ask anybody yep. who, who covers Nevada. And so uh, I, I really think that, that we as journalists should not be publishing polling memos or polling results unless we're able to see all the data. The Don't data, you love that idea? The data is probably bad because the pollsters are saying Nevada. And then, you know, that's... And that's, that's cute. See, Lee gets it. There we go. Okay, last question, and then we have to break for our last panel. Hi, okay. Hannah Trudeau, National Journal. Um, I'm wondering if we in the media are taking as the word of God too closely this uh, sort of uh, name ID high poll, like, correlation, and I don't see it challenged often, and it... I, I wonder about it when I see like Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden up in Massachusetts where Elizabeth Warren lives, in California where Kamala Harris lives, and I just wonder about that narrative being perpetuated largely on cable news but in a variety of outlets without really 
parsing it closely. Do you want to address that? Just, it's, it's still about the name ID question in that. Uh, look, I, I think people have name ID at the start of a race, and I think early out you should ignore a lot of things and a lot of yep. norms like that. You know, I used to say in 2008, you know, people in some world say, well, you have to have some norms to measure against. In the corporate world, people always talk about that. You know, in politics, that's hard. 2008, we had the first serious African-American candidate running for president. We had the first serious woman candidate running for president. What norms could you look at, right? The whole dynamic was upended in a way that wasn't easily measurable mm -hmm. from the outset. Yeah. So I thought one of the things we did in New York uh, recently, and I know NBC did it nationally, they asked about comfort with a candidate. We asked, would you be happy or not happy if so-and-so ended up with a Democratic nominee? Because that sort of, and that really was very interesting to us because at the bottom was Bill de Blasio, and then there was Kirsten Gillibrand, and went all the way up. So we were sort of neutralizing the toss-up and neutralizing the, the horse race, the horse race yeah. and, and the uh, name ID and trying to get just a sense of you know, acceptability at this point, which I think is about maybe even more than we can say, but at least it's something to say about this 20-something field of candidates. Yep. Thank you, our pollsters. And thank you, guys.